Our first speaker is Emma Hadi, uh, and the title of her project is Radicalizing the Contemporary Gun Debate, Rethinking the Genealogy and Politics of Gun Ownership in America. This project deploys historical and ideological analysis to examine American subjectivity in the context of self-defense and gun ownership. More specifically, Emma had interrogated self-defense as a constitutional right and as a right of American sub subjectivity, arguing that it has historically been denied to specific social minority groups and subjects in the United States. She contends that the ideologies of manifest destiny and the American dream were constitutive of an emergent and later dominant uh, American subjectivity defined by very specific modern ideals and democratic rights and practices in sharp contrast to other, especially Native American subjectivities and ideals. And also examines how African Americans and the Black Power movement in particular have reappropriated the Second Amendment in their attempt uh, to form armed militias to fight against brutal police forces and violent white mobs. By the same, same token, the thesis discusses the contradictory position of women in relation to the ideology of self-defense and traces women's shifting access to the so-called rights of American subjectivity. Drawing on the field of American studies, post-colonial and neo-colonial theories to supplement the historical ideological critique, this project also seeks to radically problematize and contextualize the so-called contemporary gun debate in America, highlighting most importantly its reductive, contradictory, and polar polarized logic and nature. Our first speaker, Emma Hack. Thank you, Jafar. <clears throat> this project examines the evolution of civilian gun ownership and how the ideological polarity of the gun debate in America has obscured the complex, shifting histories that have made armed self-defense central to our evolving American subjectivities. As a whole, this project first rethinks the problematic polarization of the contemporary gun debate. I'll briefly summarize this section today in order to remain critical of the present-day manifestations of the history of self-defense. Second, this project analyzes the ways that self-defense became a founding American ideology and right by looking at the emergent discourse around the desire to protect the newly forming Anglo-centric United States from Native Americans. Third, it goes on to analyze the methods with which various groups, specifically those within the Black Power Movement, have accepted gun ownership as a part of their struggle for full civil rights thus claiming the rights that are guaranteed by the Constitution, particularly self-defense. For the purpose of this presentation today, I focus on this section in order to illuminate the inherent contradictions of the right to armed self-defense, focusing on how repressive state apparatuses, such as police and legislators, restricted African Americans' use of their Second Amendment right. I use the term repressive state apparatus borrowed from Louis Althusser in Ideology and Ideological State Apparatuses, where he defines the term as including police and legislative bodies, as well as other state forces that repress those not in the ruling class, through often violent and coercive means. Lastly, this project analyzes the masculine construction of dominant American subjectivity to look at the ways that women have been excluded from self-defense discourses and practices. The Black Power section of this paper focuses on the 1960s and 1970s, examining the use of firearms as a tool of self-defense during this time period. This perspective shows the ways that mostly male African Americans within this radical movement took up firearms in order to protect themselves and their communities, which in turn illustrates the ideological contradiction of self-defense. This is most plainly seen by analyzing the repressive state apparatuses attempt to stop African Americans from exercising the constitutional right of self-defense through the use of police violence and racially motivated gun control. This section also illuminates how racist social structures allow the popular understanding of the idealized American subject 
to exclude African Americans. Self-defense is a central ideology that I critique throughout my project. I use the term ideology to describe self-defense as inspired by Althusser's definition. There are many aspects of this concept that he lists. However, I will specifically use it to characterize constructed ideas that help to legitimize and reproduce dominant political power while also helping conscious social actors make sense of their world and in some cases act as forms of thought or myths that are motivated by social interests. As a result of the importance of the ideology of self-defense, it became part of our founding documents when the United States was formed. The legal definition of self-defense was constructed to protect individuals from personal threats such as the threat of Native Americans, as well as governmental threats. In colonial and early American times, these included the tyrannical British government and their standing army in the colonies. The gun debate in America is a very heated and controversial topic. Generally speaking, the sides of the debate are divided across our political spectrum, where Democrats are classified as gun control proponents, while Republicans fall into the category of gun rights advocates. Gun control groups often take the collective rights view because many interpret the Second Amendment as guaranteeing firearm ownership rights to militia members, which they consider to be strictly those under the supervision of the government. Guns rights advocates take the individual rights view, which means that the Second Amendment is interpreted to guarantee individual citizens the right to bear arms regardless of their connection to a militia. I argue that this type of polarized debate erases the complex historical context of self-defense, which is problematic because it is the ideology that created not only gun ownership, but also hegemonic American subjectivity as we know it today. Both the gun control and gun rights side of this debate overlook the important history of self-defense in their own ways. Instead of problematizing the use of guns then and now, Gun control advocates often state that the Constitution allowed the ownership of firearms because life was different when the Second Amendment was written, and we therefore do not need guns for protection as our founding fathers did. Stating that we no longer need protection from the elements of frontier living, in which guns were actually used more for genocide than self-defense, and that we no longer need to worry about tyrannical government forces today, overlooks fundamental moments in history that have defined American subjectivity. Another side of the gun control stance is the interpretation of the Constitution as not guaranteeing individuals to own guns, but rather only those in government-run militias. This position draws conclusions about our constitutional text that are not supported by the Seven States' Bill of Rights, which were written in 1776, 11 years before our Constitution. The Second Amendment of the Constitution reads, quote, a well-regulated militia, being ne necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, shall not be infringed." End quote. This guarantees American subjects the right to bear arms for the purpose of self-defense. This individual right was supplemented by seven states' Bill of Rights, which were contributory and reflective to the federal constitution. These documents state that the right to bear arms is an individual right that American subjects need in order to protect the developing republic of the United States. However, it is important to note that at this point in time, the dominant understanding of an American subject only included white men. The National Rifle Association, or the NRA, most popularly advocates for the guns rights position. While the NRA is a gun lobby today, it was originally created in 1871 with the intention of creating sharpshooting training for the military. Today, the NRA claims to be protecting the right of all American subjects to own firearms for self-defense. However, when they were founded in 1871, firearms were used to ter terrorize African American men and their families, often with the justification of protecting white womanhood from African American rapists, even though there was no evidence to support this fear. When African American communities organized and used firearms for self-defense from these attacks, the NRA did not lobby for their right to self-defense, and in fact lobbied against it. They supported gun control legislation, such as the Gun Control Act of 1968, which was enacted as a reaction to John F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassinations and the subsequent urban rioting. 
as well as legislation, legislation such as the Mulford Act of 1967, which effectively disarmed black power groups and other African Americans in California as a reaction to armed members of the Black Panther Party confronting legislators and police. This contradictory implementation of the ideology of self-defense as an individual constitutional right shows how the NRA as the main voice for gun rights, or the individual rights view, is extremely problematic and easily swayed by racial politics. Since the NRA claims its ideological goal to be a commitment to individual freedom, as well as their changing stance for and against gun control, one must ask, whose individual freedoms are they committed to protecting? From all evidence, it would seem that they support the view of the Founding Fathers on more than just the Second Amendment, but also who is considered an American subject worthy of having access to the rights of the Constitution, white men. As illustrated, there are many flaws in the contemporary gun debate and the way that both sides structure their arguments. This debate is focused on the gun itself, rather than the social actors and contexts that shape the meaning of these weapons which shows that self-defense would not be what it is today without firearms being the tool of the Second Amendment right. In his article, Self-Government and the Unalienable Right of Self-Defense, Restoring the Second Amendment, Eric M. Pratt states, quote, weapons were considered to be a necessary means for self-defense. If individuals were denied this means, then the very backbone of self-defense would have been crippled, end quote. During the Civil Rights era, African American community members organized armed militias to protect their neighborhoods from the tyrannical, racist, white police and mobs that terrorized their homes. In this way, they attempted to combat governmental tyranny in the same way that it's addressed in the Second Amendment of the Constitution. In The Secret History of Guns, Adam Winkler explains African Americans' need for self-defense as described by Malcolm X. Quote, because the government was either unable or unwilling to protect the lives and property of blacks, he said, they had to defend themselves by whatever means necessary." End quote. While most of the civil rights movement that has been represented in mainstream America reflects the ideologies of the nonviolent Martin Luther King Jr., there were also large pushes for black power. Black power groups such as the Deacons for Self-Defense and the Black Panther Party took a much more confrontational response by advocating for self-defense by force if necessary. Many of the members of these groups came to the realization that self-defense through the use of firearms may be necessary after witnessing and experiencing extreme violence against non-violent civil rights workers. This was the case for Stokely Carmichael after seeing a fellow demonstrator, James Meredith, shot while he advocated for nonviolence as an effective method to combat white violence. Carmichael clearly defined black power as a departure from the mainstream civil rights movement, defining it as a psychological struggle that was not satisfied with the Civil Rights Bill of 1964, seeing this type of reform as a compromise that did not go far enough. In Kaylin M. A. Churcher's article, Stokely Carmichael, Black Power, he states that Carmichael, quote, told his followers that the only rights they would ever have would be those that they took for themselves and communities and civil rights workers as they fought for equal access to the rights that founded the United States and created what it means to be an American. Even though the mainstream civil rights movement was dedicated to nonviolence, they too saw the necessity of self-defense. Martin Luther King Jr. utilized armed self-defense to ensure his safety and that of his family. Winkler explains King's position on firearms by stating that he applied for a conceal and carry permit in 1956, but was denied. Even though he was committed to nonviolence, Winkler notes that he had supporters guard him at his home as well as when he traveled. This use of guns for self-defense was successful in that it allowed the ideals of the civil rights movement to be spread to the public and live on even after many of the civil rights actors were murdered, including King. Black power groups took up the gun and organized militias to protect not only their homes, but also their ideals of a world free from racial oppression. These two uses of self-defense, the former being more personal and the latter more political, reflect the two foundational uses of self-defense when it was an emergent ideology in the beginning of the United States. 
Firearms were used by these militias to fight for equal access to the American dream, just as our founding fathers did. These black power militias used the same weapons that were used to oppress them to attempt to gain the rights guaranteed to white American subjects. The increase in black power groups of using firearms as a tool of self-defense inspired a new wave of gun control legislation. These public and violent displays of firearm use by African Americans, along with urban rioting, gained much more media attention than the years of violence inflicted upon these same communities with the exact same weapons. Soon after these urban riots, the first gun control law that had been passed in 30 years became legislation. It was called the Omnibus Crime Control and Safe Streets Act of 1968. And within months, the Gun Control Act of 1968 amended and expanded the scope of this legislation. This racially motivated restriction of constitutional, inalienable, and divine rights shows the double standards that are inherent in the history of gun control legislation and points out the contradiction within the ideology of self-defense. Even though there is no shortage of conversations about firearms, these dialogues do not call into question the way that these weapons have been foundational in constructing the category of the idealized American subject. This fails to address the complex genealogy of self-defense, which erases the exclusive history of this right. Most of these conversations take place within the polarized contemporary gun debate, which does not engage the construction of self-defense as an ideology that helped to justify the exploitative, racial, sexist, and class relations on which the United States was founded. The contemporary gun debate also fails to address how the rights of American subjectivity remain exclusive well into the 1970s, as can be seen by the legislative and law enforcement's reaction to African American gun ownership. By historically analyzing the development of self-defense through the Revolutionary War time period and the Civil Rights era, this project, as a whole, breaks from the narrow understanding of gun ownership in order to contextualize the complicated genealogy of the ideologies that have shaped our understanding of the Second Amendment to show who has been left out of this American right and the implications of this exclusion. This perspective could make room for real conversations outside of the dichotomy of modern day politics, which would in turn create the possibility of meaningful, productive policies and laws that actually combat violence in the United States without limiting the rights of law-abiding subjects. I believe that this radical contextualization should be applied to all modern political debates in order to show the necessity to break free from polarized politics as dichotomies simply do not properly address the multitude of human experiences of their diverse conditions of existence. Thank you.